is this type of gap here, which is basically what we call error-induced gaps. Suppose that we take a dirty data set, such as this one, and you can tell it's dirty because it has coordinates outside of the world. They are coordinates in Earth orbit or whatever. So we know it's wrong. Which means that those, that those, those points that are spreading outside the fixed limits should be somewhere in there. So if they are here, it's because they aren't where they should. And they might have left a gap behind. So those are a phase gap. <coughs> not that the data is not there. It's that the data have been incorrectly reported and therefore do not, are not where they, sh they, they <coughs> should be. Um, uh, here's another kind of error, even more this is the same kind of error you saw yesterday. It's another example. You saw the problem with Brazil. I show you another one, which is a double reversal. Brazil problem was a mirror reversal. This one is double reversal. So not only there is a, a minus, minus, minus plus longitude, but also a minus plus long, uh, latitude. So this thing here, actually, <coughs> in the middle of Antarctica, is exactly the states, but reversed. <coughs> So it's a kind of, of dual, dual mistake. And this kind of errors, uh, uh, this kind of things left behind gaps that can be easily corrected, luckily. However, <coughs> some other errors are by design. Let, and they are, can be considered errors, but they also leave gaps behind. Let's suppose that we are the best specialists in the world in trees, but we happen to work only in the Paris region, so we only have data about the Paris region. Does it mean that all the trees are concentrated around the Paris region? In this map that you see here, each color represents a different data set, a different publisher. So people trying to work, people working on, on trees, but restricted to a boundary, they are not providing data to some natural extents of the same, for, for the same uh, species or same kind of, of data set. Analogously, analogously all the, this is a Spanish publisher that stops at the border, or this is a British publisher that stops here, and I have no idea which those orange things are. <laughs> <coughs> Basically, you see that national borders play a, play a role. So if you want to do any kind of analysis that involves cross bordering then you might be out of luck because you, if you are looking at one data set, it completely lacks data from across the border. <coughs> Another example is here. This is the Pyrenees as we see in the morning. We saw in the morning, and you see this big blob here. Hmm? Those are points that had no dates on them. Just in the morning we saw a much more homogeneous figure, but in this case we see a complete, almost complete, uh, completely gridded set of data points, which means that they co their, their coordinates have been reduced. But then we see this blob here. What is this blob? Any geography here? <coughs> this blob is a different country, which is called Andorra, a very teeny landlocked country. They put all the data they had and they forgot to put any date on it. <coughs> and as for the Spanish side, you see the regular pattern here means that <coughs> the data from a region has been, have been reduced to a coordinate with few decimal places, <coughs> which is wrong. Accessibility limitations also, uh, also, also lead to gaps. And this is dramatically clear in some of the examples that you actually have provided. <coughs> Recognize the country here. This is from yesterday's data, right? And one interesting thing is that this is very well sampled, as shown by the C values here, very high. And there are some low values here. But one very interesting thing to see is that all those dots here are along the roads. So that's because those were the areas of the country that could be more easily or less difficultly accessed. <coughs> Let's take another plot, this one from Benin, and we see the road map here, but in this case it seems that the road 
the roles of the accessibility plays a lesser role because there are many, the distribution of points outside the roles uh, is much more uh, homogeneous than. Hmm? Or, exactly, or the road coverage is only partial. We don't know. But uh, still, both things of both kinds, well, this kind of, of, of gap is a gap induced because there is not always possible to, sam to sample whenever we want or whatever we want, but <coughs> we sample wherever we can. And sometimes you simply can't, can't go there. So I call this an operational gap. It's a gap that is imposed by the reality, but the reality of not being able to go <coughs> to certain places. By far, the most common gap that you might find is the sampling induced gaps. I, I mean, gaps that are <coughs> induced by the sampling techniques you're using or the sampling constraints that we uh, have to face. And this is highly dependent on how sampling was done. We might do systematic sampling, we might, we might do random sampling, we might do uh, contingency sampling, we might do line sampling, quarter sampling. The choice of sampling technique will largely determine which kind of gaps, of gaps we might end up <coughs> encountering. The problem with uh, non-optimally designed sampling is that if you are trying to sample a long time, then you will basically restrict you will basically be restricted to your initial choice. If you are sampling a systematic way a long time, if you do bad choices in the beginning, you are stuck with those bad choices unless you start again. So the initial decision about how to sample and how to balance uh, the advantages and disadvantages of uh, each type of sample will probably wait on the entire campaign. And this, in turn, will mean that the gaps that you might be leaving by a suboptimal decision about sampling will not likely be be filled because you will have to continue sampling in the same way. So if a gap is there, the gap will continue. So it's it pays to it pays to pay as much attention as possible to a correctly designed sampling campaign or a correctly designed sampling procedure. <coughs> I will give you now a very very quick review of some sampling facts because Town has covered most of it during the morning. Remember that by sampling, we are trying to represent a bigger entity, the reality, and we are trying to ideally capture non-random information. Random information is not information. If points are distributed randomly, if data points are random, basically you get no structure or no information. That means that an unconditional sampling should be best, <coughs> because if distribution is random, then any sampling pattern will work and will return a random distribution. We try to, com to capture also enough information. And what is enough information? Well, enough for our purposes. Enough depends largely on what is being captured. The number of species, the number of occurrences, the diversity structure, all of this will ultimately <coughs> determine when you have, uh, you have sampled enough. And we try to capture unbiased information. <coughs> a badly done sampling will always return bad data. <coughs> For discovery of gaps, we, re 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 we rely very heavily on pattern analysis and pattern match analysis. For instance, we can plot the frequency of quadrats versus quadrat yield, and we might compare what we get with what we expect to get. Okay. <coughs> we expect normally a pattern that should obey one of the basic distributions, random, clumped, of, or uniform. So one thing to do normally is to study distribution of our data points. But this study will only yield correct results if the sampling was done randomly or in a systematic way to ensure that all the surface has been covered. We normally will need to factor out artifacts 
In the example I saw before, I showed you before, we saw that many points occur <coughs> along roads. If we want to see the distribution, and we don't take the roads into account, we'll almost certainly find a highly clumped distribution, probably a, neg a negative binomial or something, binomial or something like that. But if we <coughs> factor out the roads, for instance, by attributing a value, a relativeness value to each point according to how, how close to the road it was, then we might see probably a, a different distribution. The problem is that the theory behind this is not well developed. <coughs> if we see a pattern that deviates from what we expect, then we might suspe suspect there is a gap. We'll find gaps by looking at patterns that, to say it simply, don't look right. Like a void area in Mongolia or whatever. <coughs> we can easily test distributions, that's quite, quite simple. We could use the dispersion index, as you know, the variance divided by the mean will uh, be equal in any Poisson, Poisson distribution, which means a random distribution, or will be about one, about the unity, a large variance if the distribution is clumped, or it will be below one, uh, between zero and one, if the distribution tends to be uniform, which means that data points tend to be equally apart from each other. Mm? Suppose we move around in this, in this room and we hate each other so much that we try to get away from each other, but if I want to get away from from town, it's only if I get close to Rodriguez, but since I want to get away from Rodriguez too, I get in the middle point, so we all end up getting into a, a regular pattern. That's a uniform distribution, <coughs> that's a, an index of distribution below one. Uh, we took a pl plot we saw in the morning, it's this thing, might help us to see whether there's a kind of pattern that might point to, uh, to, to gaps, such as by looking for non-linear relationship between frequencies and sequences. I, re I remember you that OTU in this context means operational taxonomical unit. It might be a species, it might be a genus, it might be whatever taxonomical level you're using for your analysis. When are you capturing enough information? There's always a trade-off, what we call the trade-off cost-benefit. What we try to maximize is the benefit. The benefit is information. We want to get the most information we can from our data. But at the same time, we try to minimize cost. And what is cost? Cost is basically the amount of effort time surface that you have to cover. It can be, uh, in a very simplistic way, defined as the size of the sample or as the amount of time you have to, to invest in sampling, which often will be proportional to the size of the sample. A sample which has twice an area will take twice as much time to, to be sampled as, another <coughs> as a unit area. What avenues can we use or can we follow to analyze this trade-off? Well, we can do a standard cost analysis. Uh, normally, this is done via variance analysis because it's the most, uh, you can estimate the fixed costs and the, var in the, in the uh, variable costs, but the variance is something that will come from the data. We could do, we could do perhaps species area curves, as Tom showed in the morning, or <coughs> if we can go one step beyond using uh, second, uh, secondary, secondary information, we could try to see how uh, an ecological parameter changes over increasing increased areas, such as diversity. Not only richness, but diversity. For instance, Shannon diversity or Simpson or whatever. What is the rule here? Well, the operational rule, but it cannot always be followed, is try to minimize the product of relative cost and relative variance per unit area. That's the rule. Remember, we want to maximize return, which means minimize variance. And we, mind, we, we, uh, we mean, or we want to 
minimize costs. So if we minimize this product, relative cost, by relative variance, but we do it per unit area, 